This is CUNY TV, the television station of the greatest urban university in the world. As the sun sets at the end of a New York workday, the mind transitions from daily tasks to the cloudier, more philosophical regions of social issues, culture, and politics. In a democracy, every perspective on the world is important, and people in art and culture have surprising bodies of knowledge that can shed fresh light on today's reality. The following conversation with Ben Gould took place in Roxbury, New York on February 4th, 2021. Ben Gould is an artist whose work explores the potential and limitations of the human body. Following a diagnosis of Tourette syndrome five years ago, he adopted performance as a way to understand and manage his own physical impulses, learning tactics of restraint and release, and shaping the resulting movements into a style of dance by turns restful and cathartic, uniquely his own. So today is your birthday. Uh, how old are you? <laughs> uh, 28. 28, wow. Someone born in the 90s. The joke I've been making, we've had so much snowfall in the last, um, couple weeks is that it's like the Donner Party around here, <laughs> which of course was the, the wagon train that got stuck in the Sierra Nevadas, but you grew up yep. in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. So what was that like? It's immensely beautiful, like like it is here. I mean, being up here really reminds me of being around like all the tall pines and mm -hmm. the snow, you know, mixed with that like really intense beauty being in the Sierra Nevadas and the river that's like, you know, crystal clear with flecks of gold in the sand because it's a big gold mining town. Mm -hmm. So a big part of the history there is like the gold rush and mm -hmm. I think only now if I like really started to really appreciate those parts of the land a lot more when I mm -hmm. go back and visit now I'll actually go to the old mining museum that I always thought was so phony when I lived there. Mm -hmm. Is there a bit of an artist community there though? Your, your dad's an artist. My dad's was? an artist. My mom is very artistic. She's an acupuncturist. They were just so encouraging of <clears throat> me like mm -hmm. wanting to be an artist. I mean you're just starting out. Um, and I mean, it's amazing at your age, you're getting so much attention. Are you, have you been doing other kinds of uh, yeah. art simultaneously? So my, I was not doing performances all along. My background and most of my, my intense training was in sculpture and furniture making. Mm -hmm. I feel like when I really started figuring out what I really cared about was the point in which I discovered sculpture mm -hmm. and sort of departed from what I thought was gonna be a practice of making paintings and felt like I sort of discovered my body a little bit for the first time in that process and being Sculpture more physical. so much about the body's relationship to the object, Yeah, right? certainly. More so than painting. I felt joy in that process maybe for the first time, and I started getting interested in performance. I think a lot of that for me started with more like durational performance work and like mm. I guess finding some affinity for like images from the 70s. Performance, maybe we're jumping ahead a little bit here, but performance feels to me like it's gotten much closer to entertainment like it's not right. so frightening for a performance artist to do something that actually looks like a regular dance performance yeah. or something like that, or actually to film it in color versus like black and white photographs of those old performances from yeah. the 70s that are so <laughs> insistently art, you know, because of that format yeah. and maybe because of the patience it takes to watch yeah. them or something. But um, you were diagnosed with Tourette syndrome uh, four or five years ago? Yeah, it's like five years ago now. I don't know a lot about it, but is it, isn't it usually something that more comes out more in childhood yeah I mean so, so did it, you... it took me a while to get diagnosed I guess to backtrack a little bit I guess being diagnosed with Tourette's was what really made me discover performance well that's what I was wondering uh, about yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I had symptoms maybe when I was younger that we didn't know was Tourette's I mean people have ticks mm -hmm. and, sure. and things like that you know everybody yeah. does or not everybody but many people have ticks and and that's where it ends, you know. And for me as a kid, some things now I can look back and uh -huh. point to and say, oh, you know, that's very clearly my Tourette syndrome manifesting in this way. Or, but then I never experienced anything like that through my teenage years. And then until five years ago, sort of all of a sudden, I felt like I just sort of lost control of my body. Mm -hmm. um, and the symptoms were really intense. Is it mostly physiognomic or is it is it also in times of stress? Does so it really come it's on related and... to stress and yeah. it manifests differently in yeah. many different people. I don't think that I was particularly stressed when it when it emerged and it took a long time, I think, or it felt like a long time mm -hmm. for it to be diagnosed. I, I felt like I was sort of, you know, just going insane or yeah. no one could really tell me what was wrong. And once I was diagnosed, it, uh, a weight was definitely lifted to have a, a thing to point to and say mm -hmm. that's what's going on. You're, do you medicate for this? Or yeah, do you so do that's the downside of, of being yeah. diagnosed yeah. was then I got put on massive drug therapy yeah. treatment, which mm -hmm. uh, turned me into a vegetable. 
I definitely have some verbal outbursts that can sound like obscenities, that they don't right. feel like that for right. me. I'm not as good at, at being filtered anymore. Right. Even yeah. outside of a tick. So did you tone down on the drugs then and you've learned to kind of behaviorally cope with it? Yeah, so I couldn't really do much of anything. Yeah. I couldn't use power tools. I couldn't, you know, which was a big part of my life at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom found what looked like a fake YouTube video of a sort of experimental treatment for mm -hmm. Tourette's that had to do with the TMJs, the, tempor the temporomandibular joint. Mm -hmm. A symptom like teeth grinding or something if someone's uh, anxious or... Uh... Yeah, in a way, I guess I didn't know I had this problem. My jaw never hurt before. Right. And then I get the MRIs and they're telling me how deteriorated it is, you know. Yeah. And then it was a four-year-long, essentially, process of wearing mouthpieces that opened up the space in the jaw. That, mm -hmm. And then a, finally a surgery that moved the disc back into place. Mm -hmm. um, but pretty soon after wearing these mouthpieces and alleviating the pressure on the nerves, uh, I was able to get off of the drug therapy. Oh, wow. Um, it's also a lot, though, about um, channeling the energy, right? Yeah. I've seen a couple of your performances, and I what I see happening is, uh, from the point of view of Tourette's, is, is you seem to be channeling that energy in, into a kind of controlled exercise where you allow, like, you kind of <coughs> indulge in it in a certain yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. explain to me what the performance does for you um, Yeah, physically. so throughout the day, like now, even though I've, some twitches are percolating, you know, mm -hmm. to the surface, I'm still actively holding them back. It doesn't always feel great to just let loose. And in certain cases, like, I can't help but do that. But with the performance work, I guess I feel like it's definitely given me a space in which I can really instrumentalize and activate that sort of energy and make it feel like it has power and it's useful. And I am, yeah, entertaining that in a way and letting it transform, letting it release and in a way that I would never do, you know, here like, or on the subway or something, I guess, though yeah, I do. Yeah. I feel like even on the subway, I'm sort of training for the performances. Also, yeah, they yeah. might come up and I'll have to figure out a way of bringing that spasm back in so I don't like you know, mm -hmm. touch the person's hat next to me or something, you know, and then <laughs> right. so a lot of that is is been learning how to how to deal with it and then how to like release it in a way that still has some sort of you know, that can have meaning. What these performances express when I've watched them, they're really an incredibly intense expression of uh, sort of human physical agony, but ecstasy too. Mm -hmm. like it's it's a uh, combination they feel very catholic to me in a certain way <laughs> yeah but i think you know it's not it's not just suffering there's also kind of elation i don't experience you know intense pain i think in general the performances are very liberating for me yeah like that's a and for and for viewers yeah i think and yeah. I, I hope so you know and i guess in, in in a sense like sometimes i think that you know it, it just becomes a way of sort of passing through to some other part and mm -hmm. that's buried deeper you know and, and and is able to sort of be released through you know, I think it's important and difficult for me to really be able to see how some of these things appear really brutal at times and really intense. And then at other times, for me, something that might feel so intense and brutal can appear, you know, super calm. And well, They move, especially the ones with a <coughs> partner. Uh, if you've done performances with <coughs> Maddie Davis. Yeah. And a lot of times they feel very caring, but also, too, there's a bit of wrestling. There's a bit of, I mean, there, there's a, sort of a whole yeah. palette of different, you know, kinds of... Um, human expressions toward one another that yeah. happen in them. That's something that I always try to keep in mind. And I mean, the way that especially working with another person, the collaboration, I feel that always comes from, from care and love. I cannot really collaborate with someone that I don't feel like I really love in, <laughs> in the first place. They're um, pretty intimate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really intimate and it is really caring. And there's a lot of trust that goes sort of beyond the typical conceptions of trust and empathy, where maybe this, the most powerful form of empathy in that moment is not necessarily doing what someone else might think is right for that person but letting them experience that intensity or that agony and knowing that you both know that it's like it's okay it looks to me like a lot of what you're doing is spontaneous and it's a different kind of connection there's a different it's not technical it's very sort of like emotionally driven i understand that it's actually choreographed yeah so it, there, i mean there's a big push and pull between the spontaneity and the the choreography in a way. The work with Maddie is definitely the most choreographed that I've done because there's so much more at stake physically. Is he actually a trained dancer? So Maddie, uh, his background is in dance. Right. Um, but you, you don't have dance training. I have no dance background. Mm -hmm. So there's always that balance, I think, between the choreography of the structure and something mm -hmm. that feels a little more wild and indeterminate. And I think I'm always trying to hold on to some of that newness from what mm -hmm. feels indeterminate at mm -hmm. times. So I always try to allow some space, I think, at certain moments to feel like I'm not in 
you know, complete control. A lot of performance art is interactive, but I think that what what people are watching when they're watching you is is something that feels like it might just go off the rails a little bit or something like that, which <laughs> yeah. is thrilling. I mean, and it can and, ha and has. <laughs> you know, there, there might be a moment in which I become totally incapacitated and everything sort of needs to be put on pause. Right. Um, and that's totally fine. And sometimes can be really, really powerful. Can you talk about the vocalizations a little mm. bit? That was maybe one of the most surprising things to be yeah. watching. Yeah, through a lot of the maneuvers that I've been developing as I've been learning to control and work with and reroute the energy of my Tourette spasms, I found that vocalization can be a really useful tool in providing stabilization in other parts of the body. So a lot of my Tourette's spasms are vocal, you know, mm -hmm. but they don't ever feel that intense the ones that are really intense sometimes they do that's not necessarily true being able to allow and find a way to push that energy out through the vocal cords and being able to constrict the muscles inside the body to constrict that air and push everything through mm -hmm. a sort of another aperture allows me to then do something else that i couldn't do if I, that spasm was being expelled through the limbs or like a hand or energy sounds so vague but it sounds to me like essential to what you're yeah, talking about it's, like, <laughs> it's about i mean there's like biodynamics like trying to right. control where the flow goes or i mean yeah I so guess. many alternative <clears throat> medicines like you know acupuncture and you yeah. know your chi and all these kinds of things which i think tend to think of as being kind of woo woo oh for um, sure i mean i i <laughs> when when you know i feel like you know five years ago i had to sort of you know suddenly just shift my practice entirely i was right you know, making sculpture is really heavy, and I also couldn't lift 10 pounds for four years because of the, the treatment that I was mm. undergoing. And mm. when I was working with sculpture or dabbling in performance, it was all about, like, hyper-control, and then uh, suddenly I had no control. It seems to me um, almost just logical that, that if your body is doing involuntary things, that, ah! that it's, about, it's about sending it someplace yeah, else exactly or, oh the woo-woo that's what yeah woo-woo we're just just keeping the movement going like a shark will drown if it stops yeah. like it just has to keep swimming exactly so i think <laughs> what i think is interesting is it, it's almost the idea that um like special beings who can't sit still like the rest of us do <laughs> they just need to be kind of in motion mm, or yeah. something like that yeah know? and i think i was always a little skeptical of thinking about this my work in terms of energy and that i mean i grew up where i grew up is very this the whole town <laughs> is very woo woo so i felt like wow you know how am i going to talk about this how am i going to talk right. about what i'm what i feel like i have to make and what actually feels important to me and i guess you know the way i've kind of turned to that is that i'm literally talking about those things and working through these things it's mm. uh that literally is energy or literally is electricity you know that is being mm. moved around and and also I guess how that can be sort of expanded into a bigger scale. It seems to me this could almost develop into that that sort of terrible word art therapy or something like that where yeah. at some point you could actually <laughs> be sort of uh, talking to people with with conditions who might find release in some way through something similar to what you do. And do yeah. you think about that? I do think about that and I haven't asked about that before, mm -hmm. like specifically from people with Tourette's or I was approached by a BBC thing about Tourette's. I turned it down because it felt really wrong. And mm -hmm. I don't think about my work, you know, as therapy at all, though I think, you know, the way that I've, that we've been talking about it in some ways definitely is therapeutic or things are exercised, you sure. know, and, and through that exorcism in a way, they're sort of you know, given shape or something. Anyone who does anything creative in, yeah. in a way that is like a therapeutic thing. When I was trying to find things that really helped me deal with my Tourette syndrome, it was outside of the medical world it was outside of looking at other people with Tourette's it was mm -hmm. I was looking to I, anything other than that honestly I mean yeah I guess uh, all of the moves I would make were done specifically to feel like I didn't have a problem to feel like I was if anything you know more empowered by it yeah uh, yeah. And the medical field and other people that I had met with Tourette's, you know, just personally that I had never seen online or whatnot, it always felt like it was pushing me back into this sort of medical industrial complex of my neurological condition. And it, it was... Yeah, yeah. You become the identity of yeah. the, uh, the disease. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And I don't even really consider myself to be that disabled in that way right, or right. disabled yeah. at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I felt like when I was in the throes of an intense you know, series of spasms, I was way stronger mm -hmm. than I was, you know, when I'm working out. <laughs> and I got really, I guess I got really interested in trying to figure out for me some sort of, build some sort of mythology from the, the few things I could find mm. and start to create some sort of, I guess, narrative in a way through these symbols that felt right to me. Ben Gould's solo performance, Ardor, was filmed live in New York earlier this month for the Center for Craft in Asheville, North Carolina. 
In May, he will perform with Maddie Davis as part of the Trouble Performance Festival in Brussels, Belgium, pending the pandemic. The following conversation with Hugo Montoya took place in Roxbury, New York, on February 13th, 2021. Hugo Montoya is a Latin American artist whose work builds meaning around found objects and modest gestures. His assemblages of such common materials as sticks, feathers, masks, and shoes often conjure human-like figures that range from being strangely attractive to mildly unsettling to humorously perverse. You grew up in Florida, right? And your family is Cuban? Um, no, I grew up in Miami. My mom is Venezuelan and my dad was, is, was Bolivian. Yeah, and I think they met when they were 18 in Miami. Eventually, they moved to northern Florida together to Gainesville, and he went to school for architecture. Hmm. And then after that, I was born in Gainesville while, they were, while he was going to school, and then right. we moved back to Miami. Yeah, I mean, Miami's like the New York for uh, South America or something, right? It, yeah. So it wasn't that weird that you became an artist, right? I mean, they, your dad's an architect. Yeah. You know, I started going to community college and really didn't know what I wanted to do yet. But my mother used to be a photographer in college so she always had all her dark room equipment in the attic and all her uh -huh. books with all her photography and I was always obsessed with it and I would always ask her to, to give me this one camera that my father had left and she's like you're not responsible enough you can't you can't <laughs> uh, you're gonna lose it and and um, when I graduated high school she finally gave it to me mm -hmm. and I started photographing as soon as she gave it to me and that mm -hmm. was just you know, and I was obsessed with photography. And, you know, my dad had left the States when I think I was like 12 and I hadn't seen him. So when I turned 18, I went to Bolivia to visit him and I ended up staying there for three years. Mm -hmm. He had all these ideas that always kind of failed, but they were still fun to be part of. And, yeah. you know, and it was a really great experience because also I had never lived outside of the United States. And when I first got to Bolivia, I was always like, man, this country's backwards. Like <laughs> when I moved back to the United States, like three years later, I was like, this is <laughs> the backwards place is here. This you is. had not seen Gainesville for what it was. Right? Well, I think I had never, you know, like living in some third world country that's not driven by capitalism. Yeah. You know? It's just like, it's like, oh, you got to be human. And, but what happened was um, I got back to the States and I had a friend and, who is going to um, college and he was like, man, you know, if you love photography and you should think about auditing a couple of classes and just mm -hmm. use the labs, you know? So I did. And I was also auditing sculpture classes in those six years. Mm -hmm. And it came to a point where they were like, hey, you can't audit classes anymore. You need to figure out what you want to do, you mm -hmm. know? And I was like, you know, and I had friends like, uh, you know, you're an artist, right? And I was like, no, I'm not. And I'm like, yeah, you are. And like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what I was. You know, I guess I was an artist because I never yeah. wanted to be a photographer. I think for people who don't know a lot of artists, they don't understand that being an artist is kind of a mindset in a way. I mean, did you get your degree? No, I needed to take some tests. And I was just like, I mean, I finished all my credits, and yeah. I, but I never took the test and I never got the degree. It's not a qualification you need to, uh, you know, have a gallery show or anything yeah, it's like, like that. I, I've never not wanted not to be an artist, you know, yeah. like I've always, that's always been my drive, you know, like I never felt comfortable saying I'm an artist. Let's talk about your work. A lot of the sculptures you make have to do with uh, to try to it's like you find things and you kind of i feel like you're kind of like a, one of those like seashore scavengers or something who brings a lot of stuff home and then figures out what it will do when i was younger i had an apartment that was just filled filled with all the stuff i would find it was it was horrible and i was like oh i'm gonna make art out of this and like and of course i never did because it was just like too much stuff i didn't realize at that point in my life that objects actually carry energy. Yeah. I never did anything, you know, with all those things that I collected in this apartment. And then um, eventually I threw everything away and like became a minimalist uh -huh. and still collected things, but not like that. When did you start like putting things together in these ways that, cause they're, they're like these light gestures where it's like a stick with a tennis shoe or something. And well, it, it was yeah. definitely, it was, um, you know, I had a, a lot of money saved for, you know, because I was working cross country and I would just basically I would go and spend my day on the beach mm -hmm. for as long as I could, you know, and I would sometimes I just go every day, every afternoon and walk up the beach and collect little silly things and mm -hmm. play with them. And and it started turning this thing and a joke amongst all my friends that, you know, if you wanted to come give me a studio visit, you could meet me at the first lifeguard stand on South Beach and right. 
and um and that's where my studio was and we could watch sunset together and go mm -hmm. for a swim and snorkel and i make these land art things that never that only existed for me and my friends mm -hmm. and it has almost like a native american feeling to it it's in some ways like it's ephemeral right it's yeah. not meant to and it's not meant to be very serious in a way but i've seen those gallery installations and it does look serious i mean it's funny um and it's unexpected but but i can tell that it's it's very tightly Put together sometimes i feel like it's how i entertain myself mm -hmm. what made me realize how to work with all these things was um i was collecting things but it was a lot more refined mm -hmm. and um i had three friends who opened up a gallery in miami called gucci baton and they came and they were like hey we're opening up a gallery space and you're gonna be the third show so get ready mm -hmm. and i was like what are you talking about i was like yeah it's time you're you're mm -hmm. back home and mm -hmm. it's it's time for you to yeah to have a show, you know? And then we started talking about things and like, dude, you could basically cut this part out of your house and just show that, you mm -hmm. know? And, um, and it was funny because I guess everybody in Miami was probably expecting me for my first solo show back was to be a photography show. Right. And instead it was a sculpture show with four ideas I had for these sculptures I had. But then once they gave me the space, I started trying to make all these other sculptures. Right. Like, oh, I'm having a show. I have a studio have for the first time. I have to fill this up. I yeah. have to make this thing. And they would come and they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm making you work. Oh, <laughs> this is what an artist is supposed to yeah, be doing, right? Like, what are you? And they're like, why are you trying to be so formal? You know, it's like this moment where I was like, yeah, why am I trying to be so formal? And mm -hmm. So like, I threw away all these sculptures I was making. And I went back to the first four ideas that we had spoken about. Mm -hmm. And it turned out simple and beautiful, you know, but after... I made all the sculptures, I realized that the whole show was about tension. Mm -hmm. I like them to feel life size, you know, like, you know, that like you're standing next to somebody or a, an yeah. entity, you know, or, yeah. so I, I definitely play with that a lot. Even, you know, right now I'm making a really thin sculpture, but I'm making it, it's definitely going to feel, you know, it's going to have the feeling that it's me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, art that, is not taking itself too seriously, art that's not proclaiming its, you know, profound ideas and sitting on a pedestal, but it's more about sort of just figuring out ways to see the world differently yeah. and objects around you in a new way. I didn't even understand what my practice was till a few years ago, because I just could never understand what the gesture in my practice was. Right. And a few years ago, I, I was visiting my sister and I was on a beach in North Carolina and there was a leaf of grass and the wind was blowing it and it was rubbing against the sand and it was creating this beautiful circle. And when I saw that, I was like, even a leaf has a gesture, mm -hmm. you know? And I realized, well, it, this blade of grass is drawing a circle. Mm -hmm. That's wind, you know, and this thing, they, they've created this gesture. And I don't know why that triggered, you know, helped me understand what, what it is that I do, you know, because I, I, I'm like, okay, yeah, there's these objects in my studio. They sit around in there for years sometimes. Mm -hmm. They don't even move. And then there'll be one day that I'm like, oh, this is where this needs to go. And I'll move the object from here to there or place it where there. And I'm like, that's where it, that's where it belongs or like that's where it finally you know that's where it finally makes sense and it just hit me that is the gesture you know that is mm -hmm. your gesture it feels like nothing you know but it's not mm -hmm. it's like it's time mm -hmm. it's looking at something it's, it's it's learning to see meaning and yeah the placement of something or the selection of something your instagram feed is really funny um i presume this isn't what you intend as your real art in some ways but it's yeah certainly an expression of how you think i think but you have this uh this kind of like a teenage girl persona or something i would say <laughs> <laughs> it's funny um it's you know i grew up with my mom and my sister i think all my closest relationships are women uh -huh. i know people always think that i'm like some macho guy until they you know you know i guess when they see me it's like oh he's probably like some macho guy or something but then they're they're I, silly but they're really funny i, mean, I think i just yeah you know i feel comfortable or you know when you're doing it really makes you realize just how absurd it is that yeah. that this segment of the population is is all taught the same thing like you know to to lie recumbent and look sexy or whatever whatever it is you know they're taught it, to do you know i grew up with uh, a lot of really macho guys and i was always the odd 
went out amongst mm-hmm. all my friends. And I think later in life, when I started really hanging out with just artists, few friends of mine passed away. And then I started like questioning the male. Yeah, standards, it's like, right? well, what's wrong with like, you know, showing affection to, you know, your your friend, even if they're like the same sex as you, mm-hmm. you know, like there's nothing wrong with that. And, and you know, and like and you could be feminine and mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean you're gay. You just realize how many things you grew up with or you're just programmed to yeah. think a certain way about how boys act, how girls act, how I mean, I think it's liberating, <laughs> liberating to see um, someone playing around with those edges. Well, it was, um, I think, also earlier and you know, when I was a photographer, oh, I forgot the guy who put the book together, but he put this book together called Male Nude Next. I got published in this book because he tried to get Charles Ray uh-huh. to be in the book, but right. Charles Ray didn't rejected him. Right, right. But I had a picture of my friend next to one of those Charles Ray naked nude sculptures like right, with right, this right. face like next yeah, to yeah. the penis and um <laughs> and that's the picture that got into the book. I was so happy. I was like, oh my God, I'm in a book with Nan Golden. And my mom she was like, I Hugo, but what are people gonna say? <laughs> Hugo Montoya's work will be shown next month as part of a group show at Et Al Gallery in San Francisco. 